All right. Good morning, everybody. And as always, we are so happy that you have joined with us this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer as we start. Father, as we gather this morning, we say thank you for being our God. Thank you for the many blessings that we see each and every day. Thank you for Jesus, the, the greatest blessing of all. And Lord, we just ask as we open your word this morning that you open our hearts and minds. And Father, that we hear what you'd have us to hear. Father, we thank you so much and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I was telling uh, the staff earlier that I completely rewrote most of my sermon in about an hour this morning after, after sleeping and God basically speaking to me this morning when I woke up and saying, you know, what you've got on paper isn't exactly what I wanted to say. Uh, and our text that we're going to be in today has, has, a, has very uh, a personal meaning really for me, and we'll get into that here in a little bit later, so, to, so keep your ears open for that too because it'll be part of my testimony. But our, our text today is going to come from Mark chapter 9 and verses 14 through 28. So if you have your Bibles or if you use electronic devices, open them up. Mark chapter 9 verse 14 through 28, and I believe I'll just read everything as we get started, just to kind of get everything going. Starting in verse 14, it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. And a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? And his reply was, This kind can come out only by prayer. May God bless the reading of the word. So we, we, we start back to the top of this. Um, it says, When they came to the other disciples. Now if you look just previously in the chapter, we see that Jesus had been on the Mount of Transfiguration. A and they had come from there, back down the mountain, and come upon this scene where there was a, a huge crowd, and the, the disciples that were left, the nine that were left, because Peter, James, and John had went up with Jesus, were there arguing with the scribes and the teachers of the law. A and Jesus said, what are you arguing about? You know, and <laughs> You know, if we know Jesus like we do, Jesus knew, but he, he was trying to make a point. What are you arguing about? You know, so many times uh, we get caught up in arguments, don't we? And uh, Jesus was, was saying, you know, maybe we shouldn't be arguing. Let's see what we can do about this. And after he'd said, what are you arguing about? There was a man in the crowd that came forward and he said, teacher, I brought my son to you. You know, I believe his intentions were were to bring his son to Jesus. You know, he'd heard about this man, Jesus, who was doing these great signs and wonders and were healing people. And people were walking and people were seeing and people were hearing. And he thought, 
he can do that, maybe he could help my son. You know, I believe this man had probably tried everything that he possibly could before this, you know, to have his son healed. But he'd heard of something else, and he was coming to check it out. And when he got there, Jesus wasn't there. But apparently the disciples said, that's okay, let us, let us do this. You know, and the man says, I asked your disciples, but they couldn't do it. <clears throat> and, and that's when Jesus says, you unbelieving generation. You know, I look at that, and, and there's so many people there, I truly wonder, I, I'm thinking to myself, who is Jesus talking to? You know, and I really think at that point in time, Jesus was speaking to everyone. You know, there had been times when Jesus had rebuked his own disciples for not believing like they should. And, and the scribes and the Pharisees that were there that were causing the disturbance and arguing with them, they, they were definitely on his, on his radar. You know, you unbelieving generation. You know, and, and I look at that and I, and I think, it could even be me today, you unbelieving generation. But I go on to see, after Jesus said all that, he says, bring the boy to me. You know, Jesus has compassion on him. And he says, bring the boy to me. And, and it's interesting what, what happened. The Bible says the spirit saw Jesus and, and, and immediately threw the boy into another convulsion. You know, the spirit knew who Jesus was. He knew what was about to happen, I'm sure. And, he's, and I believe with all my heart that the spirit thought to himself, I'm going to do as much damage as I can with the time I have left. You know, and so many times I think that's Satan's purpose in, in, in life is to do as much damage as he can with the time he has left. We go on to verse 22. You know, the, Jesus had uh, asked the boy how long he'd been like that, and the man said from childhood. And... <coughs> The last statement of the father in verse 22, he says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. You know, and that's where I'm really going to start to get into what God says to me this morning. If you can do anything, please help us. You know, because Jesus' next statement is so important to this story. He says, if you can... Jesus says, you're asking me if I can, you know, creator of the heavens and earth, <laughs> look around. I've done all this. I can do it. He said, the bigger question is, what does it say? Everything is possible for the one who believes. Jesus basically was saying, you know, the, the real question is here is not whether or not I can, the real question is, do you believe? And immediately the father says, I do believe. But he was so truthful in his next statement. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. You know, there are so many times that, that we say we believe. You know, we believe God can do anything, you know. God can do anything. He's all-powerful. He's, he's, he's everywhere. He knows everything. A and we, we say that we believe that. But then as soon as we say that, our actions say, but wait a minute, I kind of doubt that. You know, and, and that's what Jesus was trying to instill into this man. It's not that, can I do it? Do you believe if I can do it? <clears throat> You see, the disciples, uh, let me back up for just a minute. Because just as soon as the man said that, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief, Jesus looked up and he saw a crowd coming. And he said, being that crowd was coming, immediately he rebuked the impure spirit and it left. You know, I look at that story and, and time and time again, when Jesus performed a miracle, a sign, you know, he, he told the person, go and don't tell anyone. You know, because Jesus, the very son of God, didn't want the spotlight even on himself. 
He said, everything I'm doing is to point to the Father. You know, that, that is the purpose of a miracle. You know, a miracle is something that, that, you know, is something that we can't explain by natural or scientific laws, something that's great, and, and, and that can only be explained by divine intervention. You know, and that's why Jesus did the signs and the miracles that he did. And that's why he did this, is so that the man could believe even greater. A and the boy looked like he was dead. And he reached down and lifted him up. He was alive. Not only alive, but he was cleansed from the evil spirit. And I believe that it never came back again because Jesus told it not to. You know, and as the disciples and Jesus were walking away from the event, you know, they were, they were pretty much probably aghast at, at what had happened and, and, you know, probably humiliated to, to the fact that, that uh, they had tried and couldn't do it. And, and they were like, Jesus, why couldn't we do it? You know, and, and in, in this chapter in, in Mark, it says, he says, this kind can only come out by prayer. You know, that's what my version says. Some of them, some versions say prayer and fasting. And, and if you look, you know, the cool part about this, the, the Bible is, you know, especially the Gospels, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each one of them is written from a different perspective. You know, it's just like if somebody is investigating a crime. You know, they ask all the witnesses what they saw because not everybody saw the same thing. And if you go back to the story of Matthew, Whenever they ask that question, Matthew says, you know what, it's because you didn't have enough faith. And Jesus said at that time, according to Matthew, that if you have the mustard seed of a faith, you know, faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say, <laughs> mountain jump, and it'll do it. You know, so through all the witnesses, we see that, that it was through faith through prayer and through fasting that we have the power to work for God. You know, and Jesus was saying, this is what you need to do. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to have faith. And he says, I'm not saying that you have to have faith a huge amount even. Just a small amount will get you started. <clears throat> you see, here's where I come to this morning. We have an enemy. That enemy is Satan. He was alive and working when Jesus was on the earth. He's still alive and working today. He was alive before the creation of the earth, I believe, and working. And he likes to focus on failures. You know why? Because if he can get us to focus on our failures we begin to accept him. A and the world uses the lives of Christians as a magnifying glass. The world will say, hey, you can't do that. You couldn't do that. And if you claim that God is all-powerful and yet you still fail, I'm not so sure that God can do that. You see, the world uses our lives and our testimonies not only to gauge us personally, but they use it to gauge God also. You know, and, and that's such an important thing that we, we have to grasp. You know, and, and Jesus was saying, you know, the fact that you had such little faith probably means the fact that you prayed little. You know, because that's usually what it means. You know, if we have little faith, we, we don't pray as often as we should. And, and, you know, if we don't pray as often as we should and seek God's will, we're absolutely not going to have the faith that God wants us to have. And the enemy wants us to keep us right there. That's where he wants us to be. Little faith, little action. You know, see... Jesus was away from the nine disciples. A and I think that separation, that physical separation, might have had something to do with the fact that their faith was somewhat hindered. A a and the, what they didn't realize was even though Jesus was away from them physically, that the power that he had 
given them was still there. It was still available to them. A and you see, that's why it's so important that we keep our focus on Jesus instead of what the world's saying. Because just like that crowd, when they saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed, it says, with wonder. You know, and, and, the, and the physical presence of Jesus, I can't wait to be in the, in the arms of my Lord and Savior. But you know what? Jesus is just as real today and with us just as real today as he was with them at that day. He says, you know, if I leave, I'm going to leave you something. And that something is the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit indwells the believer, not only by us, but in us. And, and you know, it's so easy to get caught up like in that crowd of confusion and arguing and, and get to thinking that Jesus is far away. But yet he's not. He's right here with us. And once we get focused on that, we realize that, that God is real. God is alive. God can do it. And that God will use us, not because we have great amount of faith, but because of what faith we have. <clears throat> if you look in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a parable of, of, of the mustard seed. And what he says is the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed. You know, it, it's the smallest of all seeds. And whenever you plant it, it grows into this tree that he calls it. A tree big enough that even the birds can come and find rest in its branches. <clears throat> you see, that's where this passage that I read to you earlier becomes even more important to me today than when the incident that I'm going to tell you about happened. See, about 12 years ago, I had had an or a horse accident. I was thrown off, and I br actually broke my back. A and for a long time, my back hurt. And much like this, this gentleman with a child, I was over it. I wanted relief. A and at that time, Julie and, and Tell, my son, were living here in Texas, and I was still in Missouri waiting to get everybody moved and everybody in one place. A and I was reading in bed one night, and I was reading this passage. A and I come across these words of Jesus. He says, if you can question mark and he says everything is possible for the one who believes you know at that moment my mind started whirling you know I'm like Lord I'm, I'm laying in pain thinking that nothing is going to cure this and you're saying if I believe it's possible so immediately I started praying like I've never prayed before and telling Jesus how much I believed the promises that he had spoken in the Bible, and I believed that the Bible was true, and that I believed that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? A miracle happened that day. From that point on, my back has never hurt in that spot. You know, and originally, in my, in my uh, outline, that was almost my focus, that if you believe, you can be healed. And then I realized this morning that that wasn't what Jesus was saying. He said, it's not whether I can do something. The real question is, do you believe? Do you believe? You see, with all my strength, I mustered up as much faith, mustered up faith, <laughs> pun intended there, mustered up as much faith as I could that day, and Jesus healed me. Because at that time, my faith was small. I was alone. I was in pain. And I believe God says, I think you need this to help you believe. And it worked. Because it's been my testimony from that day on that God is alive and God healed me. And I still believe God heals. But physical healing isn't the most important thing. You see, I think there's a, a rest of the story here. If you look on down past where we've read in this story, Jesus tells his disciples that pretty soon the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. 
they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. You see, the greatest miracle of all was in the works and going to happen soon. The fact that Jesus was going to overcome death. He was going to die for our sins, pay the price on the cross for each and every sin ever committed, and he was going to raise from the dead, conquering death, so that we can have everlasting life. You see, what Jesus was saying, if I can do something for this physical condition isn't really the, the point that I'm here for. You know, the real reason that I'm here is that people believe. That they believe in what I'm about to do. Believe why I'm here. Believe why God sent me. If you believe in Jesus, you've already been healed. You know, the Bible tells us before we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're living a life of death. And whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, immediately we have eternal life. So we have been raised from the dead, amen, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. John 14, 12 through 14 says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It says, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. See, the Bible says you will do greater things. And I believe those greater things that Jesus was talking about was continuing to plant those seeds of faith and helping them grow in others. You know, Jesus says, you know, I'm only here for a little while. But whenever I am leave, I'm going to give you the same power that I have and I'm sending you out in the world to continue to the work that I've started so that others may believe in God through me. You see, my nature... <laughs> It's just like most men. I say, I can do it myself. You know? <laughs> and guys, I don't know about you, but whenever I get that in my head, God usually says, oh, really? <laughs> Let's see you do it by yourself. And I usually fail. And when I do, sometimes the world takes advantage of that and says, ha, I knew you couldn't do it. But you know what? God tells us to tell them something. God says, tell them they're right. When they say, you can't do it, say, you're right. But finish the sentence. Because God says, tell them, I can't do it. But the cool part about it is, I don't have to, because Jesus already did. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You know, the cool part about this whole world is, you know, sometimes we're going to go through life with pains that we can't get rid of, with heartaches that we can't forget, with things that to this world looks like defeat. But God says all that really isn't what's important. What's important is, do you believe? And if you believe the greatest miracle has already happened, you have been raised from the dead to walk in the newness of life, eternal life. Bow with me as we pray. Father, I come to you this morning and thank you so much for Jesus. For everything that the Bible records that he did so I could read and to gain more faith, to learn more about you, to learn how much you truly love us. And Lord, the Bible says that it isn't, isn't even just a fraction of everything that Jesus did. And it's not a fraction of what you do for us each and every day. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. And Lord, I pray if there's somebody here that does not know you yet, they would not leave until they ask, how do I believe? Thank you, Father, for Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen. God bless you all.